My name is Cameron Stewart. I'm the Senior Technical Marketing Manager here at Solar Edge, and I report to this fine gentleman, Magnus Asbo. Magnus, say a little bit something about yourself. Sure, sure, yeah. So I'm the, the Senior Director of, uh, of the Residential Product here in, in North America, so it's my pleasure to help find out what it is that we all need in order to uh, uh, advance uh, solar in, uh, in North America and make sure that we're doing the right thing and to, and to help people understand what's, uh, what's happening and what's coming next. Absolutely. So let's go ahead and jump into our presentation. And this is going to be kind of an informal training, technical hour. Yeah. We're yeah. going to just kind of jump back and forth and we're going to hit the fine points and the details of how to be successful. Right. Great. Yeah. And really what we're, you know, the, the main thing that we want to be getting across here is that as solar has become more complicated, we are taking very concrete steps to make it as simple as we possibly can. And we want to reinforce that in a couple of different ways. I mean, one thing that's certainly going on is that, uh, you know, it just makes more sense to have a single vendor making all the parts fit together. You just have one source of training, one, uh, one warranty management company, you know, the software tools all work together. The parts just fit together in order to make the, uh, the system behave the way that you really want it to. Absolutely. And speaking of training, have you checked out our online training curriculums lately? I have become a certified <laughs> installer through our training. It is good stuff. Nice. It is vast and it is complete. You know, historically, we would come to warehouses and do trainings in the warehouses. But now, again, to your point, there's so many parts and pieces. It's very confusing. So I'd always push people to check out our online training, become certified. You can install our batteries, our inverters, our EV chargers, whatever you need. Uh, make sure you take the online trainings. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Um, so when we look at all the, all the parts that you could be trained about and that, that we can install and how everything works together, we're looking at what we call the Solar Edge home, right? So we're talking not just about the, uh, uh, the inverter, which you see down there in the lower left, but the battery that goes with it, backup systems, uh, the ability to interface with, uh, with uh, generators, um, smart devices that can uh, shed loads when it makes sense, uh, EV chargers, and of course our, uh, our monitoring system, uh, which allows people to have their eyes on exactly what's going on on the PV system down to the module level uh, right at the optimizer. Um, one thing that we really want to talk about in terms of making the system better and making it simpler to install is is really managing smart energy because what we're seeing is that the utilities are changing their rules uh, we mentioned a little bit about california but the same is true in north carolina i hear in places uh, i think it's a, a northern part of illinois where they actually will tell you what the rates are the day before uh, and there's an expectation that you're going to be responding the good news is that solar edge has been in this world for quite some time uh, in the uh, in parts of Europe, this idea of the uh, utility letting you know even the day ahead of what your uh, rate is going to be has been out for a while, and we've learned how to respond to that. Um, I guess, you know, I wanted to start off talking about, about California for a moment because it is moving the fastest in the near term. It's, it's large, and it's finally uh, moved uh, to uh, what we call NEM3. And uh, what you see is that, you know, at this point, rates are uh, very, very variable. We see uh, rates that change on an hourly basis every day, and those hourly rates change uh, on, a, on a monthly basis. Uh, and th although the utilities have agreed to keep um, the rates uh, according to a schedule, they change them annually. Um, so let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about what that looks like and, and what we all are beginning to respond to. Uh, so here's a, like an export table. This is what you get if you... Uh, export energy in um, uh, in California, and you can see that the the dollars per uh, kilowatt hour that you're spending um, are all over the map, uh, and they're mostly very very low. Um, and when they're very very low, obviously you want to self-consume, except sometimes. And I draw your attention to that little green spot in the lower right of your screen, where there's you know a couple of hours in uh, in September where you're going to be uh, getting an awful lot of money for your energy. Um, now, that would be great if you could train people to uh, just uh, turn off all their appliances and export all their energy for two hours in, uh, in September. 
Um, but Cameron, is, is that really feasible? Can you train people to do that? And is it going to stay the same over, over time? I mean, you can try. <laughs> you can certainly try. But historically, we definitely know that people don't generally change their energy habits for less using less energy. They generally start to use more energy when they get solar. And so the good news is, you know, we don't, they don't, we don't have to train them. Solar Edge takes their battery management algorithm. We make it automatic and it addresses those changing rates that change year over year. So you don't have to worry about it. And I think one, thing that's important worth noting is like even if you're not in california and you're not being impacted by the net billing tariff historically what we see is things happen in europe first then it comes into hawaii california and then it spreads throughout the rest of the country so that's why we're starting to see time of use rates or zero export rates in other parts of the country but california is usually impacted first and then it kind of trickles throughout right and I think we're also seeing things like uh, uh, peak rate uh, or, or peak shaving rates in, in Arizona. So that's been there for a while. So it's always been complicated, but it often gets complicated in, in different ways. Yeah. But again, to your point, Solar Edge has got you covered. That's right. We manage everything for the homeowner trying to make it easy. That's exactly it. So here in uh, in September, you know, we'll do something like we'll make sure that during the course of the day, the battery is charging. Uh, and then when it's the right time to take all of that energy that's been put into the battery, we will push it out to the, uh, uh, to the utility and make sure that, uh, that the homeowner is getting the most amount of money for uh, that solar energy that they possibly can. Um, so, you know, one thing that I was wondering was, gosh, this looks, uh, looks a little bit uh, complex. I mean, that's a, that's a lot of information there on that graph. There's a lot of uh, uh, intelligence behind the scenes making this happen. But, you know, is it hard for the homeowner to manage? I mean, what, what are they going to be doing? Well, primarily, we want our homeowners to be able to set it and forget it. That's and right. And so very quickly and easily, all the homeowner has to do is go into the My Solar Edge app and then uh, select the time of use rate and then select their utility, and it's done. That's set it. it and forget it. Yeah. So we're trying to keep it simple for them. Um, the other thing, though, if you're if you're in a situation like that where energy is just you know really really worthwhile, and this doesn't matter where you where you are. I mean, there are, there are times when energy it's much better to export your energy than to hold it. So it's like a game of poker. You got to know when to hold them and know when to <laughs> throw it in. And in this case, sometimes you want to you want to hold back uh, consumption. Um, so is is that a good idea to be able to you know change your consumption during the during the course of those days? Yeah, sure. So. Uh, what I usually hold power for or energy for is for when I'm going to be in a grid outage scenario mm -hmm. or if I'm just trying to maximize my self-consumption because it's not advantageous to sell it back to the utility company. So that's typically when I hold my energy. Okay. And when do you, uh, when do you, when do you start exporting it and what should you do? Only when prices are high. So if my export rate is higher than my import rate, then I start selling energy to the grid. I think there was a, uh, a word for that, a phrase, buy low, sell high. That's I think it. I yeah, think that's yeah. <laughs> so to help you buy low and sell high, we've uh, also uh, been putting out these smart energy devices. Right. Um, and the smart energy devices really are there to, to assist with that selling high concept. So if uh, energy is uniquely uh, uh, valuable, either you're in backup, you know, you're off grid and you want to make sure that you're, uh, uh, you're conserving energy as much as possible. It's time to turn off the pool pump. It's time to turn off that hot tub. Uh, you know, energy is, is valuable and you can uh, have a nice soak a little bit later on. We have these devices that allow that to be, uh, uh, to be managed and it can be done using that battery management algorithm. Uh, so you uh, see that we are releasing these devices now that are completely integrated into the, uh, into the system. And Cameron, do we have one of those uh, little load controllers I here? I do. I think I've got one right behind me. All right, there great. So this uh, load controller that you see in the upper upper left of your uh, your screen, it's not uh, it's not a very large device. Really, it's just designed to uh, uh, be connected to our home hub inverter over uh, our our home net interface and be able to turn things on and off. Um, you cannot run you know a uh, huge load straight through this box. You're going to have to use a uh, a contactor with it in order to uh, in order to do that. And I've so, got one of those too. <laughs> oh, you got one of those too. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, so for those that 
of us that are solar installers and may not know what a contactor is, all this is is a switch. It's an electromagnetic switch and we apply voltage to turn on and off the switch. So that's what the load controller does. It applies that voltage based on the settings. Mm -hmm. And it could be when I go into backup mode, I want to shed loads. Right. Or it could be on a timer where uh, from my on peak time from five to nine, I do not want this load to run. Or it could even be on excess solar energy. I have extra solar energy that I'm not using and I don't get anything for it to, to go to the grid. So I do want to run a load. And all of those things can run simultaneously. So all this does is turn on and off the load and our solar edge load controller controls it. Nice. Now, Cameron and I have actually wired these together. It's not actually terribly hard. That's not work that you really want to do when you're, uh, when you're in the field. You don't want to be sitting there cutting and stripping wires and fiddling around with it. So what we are working on is the ability to combine these devices into a single box in order to allow you to control those critical loads that are, that are out there. So this is the packaging idea that we have around this. And you'll see us introduce this into the market in the, uh, in the early part of the next year. But the idea here is that we are uh, placing the contactors in there, we're pre-wiring it, we're making it easier for you just to take wires from the circuit breaker that, that powers like a, uh, a hot tub, run it into a contactor, run it back out again. You don't have to worry about the controls. This is essentially done for you. Nice. Okay. Um, so those are, uh, those are some of the things that we're doing in order to allow control of energy. Uh, just a couple of other things that are worth men mentioning. We uh, also there on the right, you'll see that we uh, do manage hot water. So we've released a uh, hot water controller. So when energy is uh, in abundance, let's say it's four o'clock in the afternoon, the batteries are all full. You can take that extra energy and use it to heat up water in an electric hot water heater if you have one. Uh, we also have, uh, for several years, had an integrated EV charger. So we can say, hey, if you have excess solar, this is a good time to put energy into your EV. So not only are you driving a, a, a clean green car, but you're charging it with clean green electrons. Um, similarly, however, if energy is uniquely valuable for one reason or another, you can sort of taper off the amount of energy that's going into the EV for a minute uh, and then pick it up later on when, uh, when energy is is more readily abundant. Um, so you know, those are some of the things that we're doing to make, uh, uh, to make the uh, smart energy easier to control. Uh, but you know, one of the things that we know about is that there are problems with uh, just installing larger P PV systems. And you know, what are some of the challenges that come with installing a larger PV system? Well, we've always had the NEC requirement around the 120% rule, right. which limits our backfeeding breakers. And there's been some magic that we can do revolving maybe a renewable meter adapter or a generation meter adapter or maybe derating the main breaker mm -hmm. or the worst case scenario a main panel upgrade uh, bum, bum, but bum. now mm -hmm. what do we have well you know in order to get around that main panel upgrade the uh, thing that we're going to be re releasing is uh, something that we call power control system bus bar management and this is a, uh, a scheme whereby we can actually work to uh, uh, go around the 120% uh, the rule. So the 120% rule, for, for anyone who's not familiar with it, uh, essentially says that if you have a bus bar and it's rated at a, at a particular current level, 20% of that bus bar can be used for, uh, for renewables. Uh, and you can see here in the little diagram that uh, on this 100 amp bus bar, we were allowed to put a 20 amp circuit breaker in uh, in order to uh, uh, hook up our renewables. Now, how much, how much does that limit us to? Uh, 3.8 kilowatts of solar. And uh, in a world where everything is moving towards electric, it really limits our ability to support that infrastructure that is required for EVs, for electric ranges, for all those things that we're adding to the grid. Mm -hmm. So I've got this uh, little craftsman cottage that I live in. It's got a 100 amp uh, main on it. So you're saying that the biggest inverter that I can install without ripping out my main panel is, is 3.8 kilowatts. According to the 120% rule, yes. Okay. So we are seeing that this often comes up as a, uh, as a specific limitation. And as we were pointing out, it's expensive to do that main panel upgrade, sometimes north of $2,500. I mean, how long have you seen it? 
Uh, yeah, I would say, you know, main panel upgrades today cost between $3,000 and $5,000. And it really does cost adders if you have to run new conductors from the main panel back to the pole or to the transformer. I mean, that just stacks. Right. You, if you're doing that, then your main panel is even more expensive. Right. So the realization that we've had around this is that it puts in a lot of delay, a lot of cost. And really what we're trying to do is provide safety at that bus bar. And that is why the 120% rule is in there. And the realization is if you can ensure that you're not drawing 100 amps from the grid, uh, then you could potentially provide more current from PV if you have that awareness. So you could do something uh, like this diagram where you see that you've got a 100 amp circuit breaker uh, attached to the inverter and you have a, uh, a current transformer at the bus bar that's monitoring how much energy is coming from the grid. If that grid is not putting excess energy onto that bus bar, you have more room for energy from your renewable system. So this uh, allows you to uh, put a larger system onto there and, uh, and essentially get around the 120% rule. Uh, you know, you're never going to be uh, overtaxing the bus bar, but what you are doing is that you're allowing the system to shift its consumption from the grid to that larger, uh, that larger inverter size that's, uh, that's behind that, that larger circuit breaker. Um, so Magnus, we did have a question come in. Sure. What does PCS stand for? Uh, PCS stands for Power Control System. And uh, it is defined in a couple of different ways depending on whether you're looking at UL or, or NEC, but colloquially we call it Power Control System. Um, and I think it's really worth mentioning that the power control system specifications cover a host of uh, different uh, methods that are out there. For instance, you can have PCS where you are certified to be a zero exporter, where you can measure the energy at the, uh, uh, at the point of common coupling and certify that you're not exporting any energy. Similarly, we're already certified that if you connect our battery system, we're only going to charge the, uh, the battery from DC. There are different ways of, uh, of using the power control system specification. What we're doing here is we are using the power control system certification to cover very specifically bus bar current management. We call that BCM. We can call it lots of different things, but the idea is that we are actively managing the amount of current that is going on to the bus bar and we are going to be certified uh, uh, according to the uh, PCS rules in order to allow, uh, allow that operation. Thank you, awesome. Um, so this is, this, is, this is great, so it sounds complicated. Uh, for an installer, what do they have to do here? Well, with PCS bus bar management, all they have to do is install a couple of CTs on the feeders to the service entrance. Mm -hmm and run those wires back to the meter on the inverter, which is factory installed. So all they have to do is run a pair of CTs. And now you can avoid main panel upgrades. You can avoid uh, service side or supply side taps. You can avoid derating main breakers. We can install bigger systems to help support the electrical infrastructure that we need. Nice. Uh, and in order to do that and to configure it, uh, is reasonably straightforward. There is a, uh, a, going to be a page in, se in setup, uh, which allows you to activate uh, bus bar current management, has a couple of big, uh, basic questions. How big is your, uh, uh, your uh, main circuit breaker? Have you derated it? Uh, and then what's your bus bar rating? Uh, and based on that little bit of information that, was, that will allow the uh, activating bus bar current management, and it will uh, essentially enable the intelligence inside of the inverter to, uh, to, to run that system. So also, we had another question come in. Sure. So are we going to utilize the same revenue grade meter that's on the inverter today and the same CTs, the Solar Edge slim clamp-on CTs that we use today? So for the meter, we uh, need to tr teach it a new trick, which is we simply have to see whether or not uh, uh, the CT is connected. If it detects that the CT is not connected, then we need to revert to the 120% rule because it's a uh, you know we're literally controlling the uh, the thermal performance of the uh, of the bus bar. So we are making that addition to the uh, to the meter. Uh, so you will be able to get a new meter. It's going to look exactly like the old meter, uh, and uh, we will both sell a version of our uh, home hub inverter that will have this new meter inside of it. And we're also providing a retrofit kit for systems that already have our revenue grade meter 
you just click it off, click the new one in, it is, it's sitting on a DIN rail, it's quite straightforward. In terms of the CTs, we are going to be using the uh, SolarEdge Slim CT uh, in order to do this, so it's the same CT that you find in stock essentially everywhere. Thank you. Okay. So sometimes, though, um, my understanding is that people want to be able to get energy from multiple sources. And we've talked about getting it from the grid, from the renewables. We've talked about getting it from batteries. But sometimes people want to connect generators, don't they? Yes. Generators are always a hot topic for me because I dabble in a lot of backup systems. And I get constant questions about our ability to automatically start and stop generators. So officially, we now support two-wire start-stop on any standby generator that has that functionality. So your Kohler's, your Generax, your large Briggs & Stratton, they'll be able to do it. And so you have to get, some of them you have to buy the kit separately. Some of them have the kit factory installed. And so once we go into backup mode, we will prioritize using solar and battery energy. Mm -hmm. And once the battery becomes completely depleted, we open up an AC relay inside the inverter and isolate the inverter from the backup system. And then we t signal the generator to start. So once the generator starts, then we provide power to the backed up loads using the generator. And then once the grid is restored, we turn off the generator and we resume normal production. Nice. Do you have to have another transfer switch for the generator? Uh, that's, that, that's pretty typical. You have to have it like another transfer switch. Yeah, right? that, that's a great question. So no, because the transfer switch is integrated into the backup interface and you wire the output of the generator directly to the backup interface. Nice. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible. Again, very simple interface. Just connect the, uh, the generator directly to the backup. Uh, to the backup interface. There are a couple of terminals that have been in there all the way along, uh, and they are, uh, they are now able to accept a, a generator up to uh, 22 kilowatts in, in power with a start-stop capability. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about you know, the, the kinds of things that people are seeing in the field in order just to make, uh, make it easy to do installations. And this is a case where it's all about details, just going through, finding problems, and uh, making sure that uh, uh, that it's easy to do things that, that before were, you know, just little problems. Like, here's an example. Um, if you're going to uh, be connecting uh, two batteries, for instance, to one of our, our inverters, previously, how would you do that, uh, that, that wiring? So historically, when you're trying to connect two batteries to our inverters, we sold these Y connectors, which would uh, parallel the battery output, and then you'd have just a positive, negative, and ground back to the inverter. And the beautiful thing about the Y connectors was because it was installed at the battery, you didn't have to install another J box or anything else to right. parallel multiple batteries. Now, a lot of our installers said, no, oh, these Y connectors are, are bulky or they sourced, the worst case scenario, they sourced the wrong ones and they weren't rated for the amount of current. And so we got rid of the Y connectors, or I guess you can still buy them, but uh, now you can land two batteries inside the DC disconnect of the inverter and that's where we parallel them at the inverter. Because often the battery is really close to the inverter and so running an extra pair of conductors is, is fairly easy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's a nice little detail that just makes it easier to uh, to install these systems. And as you start expanding to uh, to two batteries and being able to do that, we just want to have you be able to run the uh, run the wires directly into the box and away you go. Uh, another thing that we've really seen is that we have our setup application. Our setup application is uh, uh, really a great way to uh, access all of the settings that you have on the inverter. But sometimes, uh, if you've never done this before, or, uh, uh, or you've, you haven't had a second cup of coffee, you might forget what you, what you need to do in order to make the installation successful. You might skip something. So what we're trying to do here is, uh, uh, is really make it possible to uh, be led through here. And we've made three big uh, changes, one of which is we're trying to do skipping firmware upgrades right on site. So cutting out uh, uh, some minutes there. We're trying to do uh, uh, wizards in order to make the, uh, the installation more, uh, more seamless. And we're also trying to make it so that counting optimizers and connecting to the optimizers is just a faster process uh, overall. Uh, and I wanted to start off, and Cameron, I know that you, uh, I think you did your, uh, your brother's house a, a, a little while back. You were, you were installing a, um, a, 
a solar edge system yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you have uh, some some uh, some recent experience working with uh, with setup as we've been uh, uh, folding these these features in. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the uh, things that I did at my brother's house. So he lives in Chandler, Arizona, and he had an old SMA inverter that I installed. 17 years ago now mm -hmm. and so it was sharp panels that are 142 watt and 72 watt triangle panels so a very old legacy system right so we updated the modules and put optimizers on them and now all of the modules the system performance is much better because we have module level power electronics and we actually found three modules that were completely dead because they had burned diodes on the back. Huh. And so now the system is performing much better because we don't have that limiting factor uh, with a string inverter. And then secondly, we added a couple of batteries. And so the commissioning process, even with adding more solar, adding power optimizers, and adding the couple of batteries, because everything is using EnergyNet, the commissioning process was super simple. And I even was training some new, uh, new field service engineers that SolarEdge has hired on for the region. And we went through it together and they're like, oh man, back when I was installing it, it took so long, but those incremental improvements are really starting to stack up. And I'm seeing, I'm comfortable saying with a two battery system and 55 power optimizers on the roof, uh, we commissioned that system in under 40 minutes. Nice, okay, that, that's awesome. And some of the tools that we've been uh, providing in order to get that, uh, that increase in speed is, uh, uh, first of all, we're able to uh, get you commissioning and uh, do that in parallel with or or just delay doing the firmware upgrade so it allows you to get in there connect up you you put your PV system up you you put your inverter on the wall it's finally hot uh, and rather than saying uh, time to wait for a firmware upgrade you can just skip the firmware upgrade and do it later and uh, and go ahead and start doing the uh, uh, the commissioning at that time currently this is for a PV only system you know likely we will expand this concept to uh, more complex systems, but the idea here is that the commissioning process is not going to be held up by waiting for the uh, the firmware on the system to update. Uh, as I was saying, we're also trying to make it easier by uh, putting in commissioning wizards that essentially will take uh, an installer through. Lots of people know exactly what they have to do, but this is just a, a very nice way of making it step by step so that you don't skip a step as you go through. So we've. Uh, created these, uh, these seamless guides. These are especially helpful when you're doing more complex systems like uh, uh, battery systems with backup. Um, and then the third thing that we're doing is we're making it possible to do pairing of, uh, of optimizers really quick. So on a system like, uh, like Cameron's Brothers uh, out there in Arizona, you could see all the optimizers, get the, collect them, put them, uh, connect to the uh, inverter in about three minutes. Uh, and that is a, uh, a really nice, uh, it, uh, decrease in the amount of time that you spend waiting for the inverter to uh, to recognize the uh, uh, the module level power electronics. Um, so that's that's kind of what we're doing with our uh, our our setup software. But a lot of the things that people do in the field are are much more practical, much more hands on. And I wanted to bring up this picture, um, which you can see here. And, you know, honestly, at this point, I've looked at this picture a couple of times, and I, and I think to myself that it's always looked like that. But uh, <laughs> what is it that you see there that's new? <laughs> yeah, so on the wall behind me, we have a big gray box. And in the, in the industry, we call those uh, gutters. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's just an electrical raceway. And what we find is that a lot of installers were using these gutters on every single job because there is a bottom entry into the backup interface and into the inverter. And there's like a multiple conduits that have to go in between those two devices. And it just made the installation a lot easier. So Solar Edge thought, well, what if we took all the measuring and we took all the drilling and the templates away and we just designed our own gutter at a, at a lower cost. So that's what this guy is. Oh, well, you got one here. I got one right here with me. And so it's a, it's a really cool, uh, composite enclosure that is easy to handle. Mm -hmm. It has all of the drill templates that tells you exactly where to drill. And then it has an accessory that you put on top and it tells you exactly where to put the mounting bracket for the inverter and for the backup interface. And the most beautiful thing about it is it's really speeding up installation time because there's no measuring and it improves your accuracy because there's no measuring. Right. And it, all the, 
the thought that went into this where the screws uh, line up with the backup interface and with the inverter, you can do a uh, backup interface on the right or on the left just by flipping it over. And it's, it's a fantastic little enclosure and I'm very proud of it. That's really cool. Uh, so little things that make a big difference. In this case, it's a bit bigger, but uh, um, you know, we're finding that there are a lot of things that we can do just to speed things up. So this is a uh, uh, saving real time in terms of being able to wire those more complex systems, making the backup interface uh, uh, connect uh, uh, more seamlessly. By the way, I've seen it. It's a lot of these systems uh, with these uh, uh, solar edge connection units where the battery actually sits underneath. Yeah. And that's pretty compact, isn't it? Yeah, so it, it creates a nice little tight package that doesn't take up much space on the wall. And one of the beautiful things about it is we also include the, uh, the conduits that run between the inverter and the uh, backup interface. And because everything's composite, it really saves on your need for grounding bushings and stuff like that, because you're just gonna run a ground wire. There's no need to ground the conduit anymore because it's not a metallic raceway. And so you can run a ground wire from the inverter to the grounding bus bar and you know make sure you have all your appropriate EGC and GECs crimped together. Uh, and then if you put the battery right underneath, then you have a nice little compact view of a backup interface, an inverter, a battery, and a solar edge connection unit. And it looks like all of the things belong together nice. instead of one weird looking gray box and a different weird looking gray box and other things. So it just makes everything look a little bit better. Nice. Now you mentioned a lot in there about grounding. Um, and uh, this is something that uh, uh, one of the one of the one of the secrets of uh, of, of installing in America, and, and we do have to explain this to the rest of the world, where they just use plastic everything, lots of uh, shielding, is that we have to ground our conduits, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, that usually means putting in uh, what what are those little things called? The bush. Yeah, grounding, grounding bu bushings. Grounding yep. bushings. So what we've been uh, working on is making it so you don't have to use grounding bushings. And, and how are we doing that one, Cameron? Yeah, yeah. So we have this little uh, grounding plate that you can see uh, on your screen maybe or right here. And this has uh, basically is going to go inside the inverter and it has a ground wire that runs from this grounding plate to the grounding bar. And because the conduits can now ground to this device, there's no need for grounding bushings. So one of those three quarter inch grounding bushings, I think costs about four or five bucks these mm. days. And so if you got four of them, you know, that's 20 bucks on every job, wow. on every inverter. And then I know a lot of installers that aren't quite clear on the rules around grounding bushings, which is you just have to have one on one side of the metallic conduit, metallic raceway, uh, but they're overly cautious and they put it on every single connector. And so now you're just replicating that. So like if you have one inside the inverter and then you have another one inside the gutter, now that's eight grounding, grounding bushings. bushings. Mm -hmm. And so that's 40 bucks. Mm -hmm. And so that really starts to add up. So we're gonna start putting these in from the factory. Yeah, they're gonna be in the, from the factory. That's right. Every single, uh, uh, every single one of our inverters will have basically an integrated uh, grounding plate that'll allow you to install without having to put in the grounding bushings for one and also without having to uh, cut and cr uh, strip uh, and install those ground wires that uh, that you see there in the in the upper picture. Yeah, that takes a lot of time just making sure those ground wires look good. You know, your workmanship, they just run directly to the ground bar and you don't have to run them through the grounding bushing. That's another time saving. Right. I'd say probably uh, five, five minutes per connector. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, then the last thing we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, uh, was just how to make things more robust. So, uh, you know, the, the real world with, uh, um, uh, with uh, things happening on, on the grid, with transients, with uh, clouds, it can be actually, uh, you know, a lot of heat, especially, you know, like at your, your brother's place in Arizona, things can get really hot. Uh, we've really wanted to make sure that the inverter is as reliable as possible and that uh, you're not having to uh, to go out and, and replace because things got too hot or, or, or something happened. So we've been working on everything that we can in order to uh, uh, do improvements to uh, to long-term reliability. And the, uh, the main things that we're able to do now that, are, uh, that have been changing is, first of all, we've really uh, uh, increased the robustness of the capacitors that are inside of the, uh, that are inside of the inverter. Uh, and uh, that's been happening over, uh, over the course of the last, I think, a uh, couple of quarters that those have been phased in. And uh, um, 
uh, and uh, it's performing exceptionally well this way. So why is automotive grade the kind of the words or the standard that we want to think about when we think about these new capacitors? Well, really the reason that we're going after the, this grade of capacitor is that they are essentially what are being put into, into cars in, a, in extremely harsh environments. You know, if, you're, if you have a car, you can't help if it's parked in a, uh, uh, a parking lot in, uh, uh, in, in Arizona and it's just getting smoking hot. Uh, they are designed for exceptionally high temperature environments. They are designed for uh, exceptionally cold uh, temperature environments. Uh, you don't know what's going to happen, so they are designed for that much, much broader uh, temperature and performance range than, uh, than standard commercial uh, capacitors. So we've made this change. So they're better. They're better. <laughs> they are stronger. <laughs> Fantastic. That's good news. Okay. The other thing that we've done in order to uh, uh, kind of manage uh, uh, thermal performance on these inverters, and you probably have started to see this, is that uh, we've deepened the heat sink on uh, our uh, larger inverters, and we are actually going ahead and starting to deepen the heat sink a bit on the, uh, the smaller inverters as well. So you may see that as you, uh, as you do, uh, do the installation. The performance is exactly the same, but we are making it so that the, uh, the inverters can shed heat more, uh, uh, more efficiently. And I think one of the uh, interesting notes about this is uh, we deepened the heat sink, but we were very particular about the mount we deepened it just in case you need to swap a, an old inverter with a with a new deeper heatsink inverter just because it's really hot where you live or where the installation is. It's the same distance as a as an offset as a conduit offset. So it's about three quarters of an inch, and so it makes that swap fairly easy to do. Nice. Okay, that makes it that makes it easy. Awesome. We try. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, that is, uh, those are some of the things that we've been doing in order to make uh, life easier and better for the installation experience. Uh, we're making it easier to deal with uh, uh, changing uh, utility rates uh, as those adapt, making it easier for the homeowner to respond to those utility rates, making it easier to install uh, load control devices uh, to do shed loads when you, when you need to. And we're doing everything that we can to kind of go through those details of uh, through setup to make everything uh, wizard driven uh, in, uh, and speed up uh, firmware upgrades and uh, detecting optimizers. And we're going through and taking care of details in the physical inverter, grounding plates, uh, making it possible to, to land multiple batteries and just generally beefing up the, uh, uh, the behavior of the system. So uh, it's exciting. There's a lot of things going on here. There are an awful lot of thing, other things that we could talk about with regard to uh, uh, the DC bus architecture, but I think that's about all we have time for today. So uh, Cameron, do we have a couple of questions coming in that we should we cover? We do have a couple of questions. So one was about the batteries. How many batteries can we connect to a solar edge inverter? So you can connect up to three batteries to a solar edge inverter if you've trained me right. That is correct. We can connect up to three batteries. And in our presentation, we talked about the ability with the new terminal blocks to connect two batteries directly to the inverter. So that is an excellent question. So what happens when I have three batteries? Because technically I'm allowed to do it. And absolutely, in that case, you would actually parallel the batteries with the Y connectors, or even if you wanted to parallel them with your Wago uh, terminal clamp uh, connectors or even Polaris lugs or wire nuts if you felt so inclined as long as they're DC rated and wet environment rated. Uh, but yes, you can do any of those methods to parallel the battery outputs to get it to the inverter. Uh, in practice, what we typically see the most common configuration is going to be a single battery or two batteries. We very rarely see three batteries connected to a single inverter, but uh, you can still parallel it like you used to. Absolutely. Great. Uh, another question we got was about generators and when <laughs> can they charge the batteries? I'll take this one. So generators, uh, can they charge the batteries is a great question. Uh, so right now I said when the generator is running, the inverter is electrically isolated from the generator. So at this time with this particular firmware version release, no the batteries will not be able to be charged from the generator. Our next firmware release for, bat or, excuse me, for generators will allow the generator and the inverter to run simultaneously. So we'll have congruent power output. Uh, and then the release after that, we will get generator's ability to charge the battery. And so that's, uh, 
uh, a little bit more challenging, but uh, we're working through it because we want it to be compatible with all generators. As long as, it, as long as it has a 240 volt output, we wanted the ability to use that generator. So it takes a little bit longer for the development of the firmware. Makes sense. Is that gonna require that they change hardware? No, because it's all firmware related. All the hardware is already set up. So it's not gonna, it's not gonna require hardware changes, just firmware changes, and we can shoot firmware upgrades remotely. Nice, okay, so somebody could go ahead and install now, and then when they want those, uh, those future firmware releases, they can ask to have them pushed, and that capability will be installed, is that right? That is correct, yeah, Great. absolutely. Uh, another question was, oh, will this uh, webinar be available on a recording of some type? Uh, yes, always and forever. We wouldn't do these if we couldn't record uh, whether I say terrible things and we have to chop it up a lot is another question, but <laughs> it should be available on YouTube. Uh, and I think we do email out the recording as well. Nice. Uh, how does the system perform with a span panel? Why don't you take this one? Sure. Uh, we've been working with uh, the folks at SPAN for, uh, for some time, uh, and uh, we connect uh, very readily with them. Uh, we have a direct relationship between the two companies. So essentially, we're giving them the ability to look into our inverter and see uh, uh, what the, uh, uh, the capability of the battery is, how, what's its state of energy, you know, do we see the grid up or down. Working with a SPAN panel, you'll continue to use our backup interface as the, uh, as the disconnect from the... Uh, uh, from the grid, uh, but we will allow the span panel to, uh, to do the energy management. Uh, and for people who want to have that kind of whole home energy management system where you're controlling every single circuit breaker, uh, it, is, it is a fine product and, and we enjoy working with the folks at Span. Absolutely. So another uh, very great question is, if the, uh, is it better to use a home hub three phase inverter if the battery will be installed as part of the project? So I think we should clarify that the home hub inverters are all single phase. Now we do make some that are 240 and then uh, two part numbers can be reprogrammed to be a 208 volt single phase inverter, not three phase. So you can still connect a battery to those particular inverters, but if you want backup, it has to be 240 because right. the backup interface is 240 volt. Yeah, and, and I should point out that uh, we are a global com company and the great no news of that is that uh, we get a lot of experience from other regions. Uh, you know, we test things uh, in Australia where it's uh, super smoking hot. We test things in Europe where they have a lot of variation in the way that utilities uh, work with them. So that's why we're ready with this battery management algorithm before, uh, uh, beforehand. The downside, however, is that if you go onto the, uh, the internet and look for our products, sometimes you'll actually find uh, uh, products that are for other regions. And in this case, uh, there is such a thing as a three-phase uh, uh, home hub inverter that's being used in Europe because a lot of homes there are actually on three-phase. Uh, here in the United States, uh, we're obviously split-phase. So we are working exclusively with the split phase uh, uh, home hub inverter. So if that confused you, that's, uh, that's what's going on. Uh, we, uh, we do not have a, a three phase home, uh, home hub inverter for, uh, for North America at this time. Yeah, thank you, very well said, thank you. Uh, and then one more question, because we're at our time. Uh, one more question is, does the load controller uh, on our desk, does this work with all home hub inverters? And uh, the answer to that is, as long as the home hub inverter has energy, excuse me, the home network, or what we used to call energy net, as long as it's got a home network chip, then yes, this will work. So that is the requirement. Uh, if you're using an LG battery that has a hardwired connection, then it will not work. You have to have a solar edge battery, uh, or I guess you can have no battery, a solar edge battery, uh, and those, those inverters will work with the with the uh, load controller here. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna repeat that one back to you because <laughs> yeah. it's a little complicated. So you can use the home load controller if you are working with a, uh, a solar edge battery or no battery. Um, you do need to have the home net card installed inside of the, uh, the inverter. Uh, and generally this, uh, the home net card will install in really any of our, uh, our contemporary inverters. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we provided an additional slot uh, for, uh, for that home net card. Uh, 
older than that, uh, there is a slot that uh, uh, that often is uh, taken up with a cellular modem. You can put the home net card there, but now you've got to connect uh, uh, the system to the internet in some other way. So it's a little complex, uh, but uh, uh, but in general, if you buy a uh, a home hub inverter, you are going to have the ability to connect to uh, all of these uh, uh, these load controllers uh, pretty straightforwardly. It's over a wireless mesh network. Uh, it is uh, very simple to connect, and actually the more of these that you install onto a system because it's a mesh, the more robust the mesh becomes. Uh, so uh, a, really nice, uh, a really nice product, but uh, do be aware that if you're reaching deep into the past and you have an old, old home hub uh, and, uh, and it's got a, a cellular card in it, uh, you're going to have to make a choice in that case. Okay, and then I know I said that was that one last question, but right. this last question was actually a really good one that I get very frequently we talked about what we're doing for installing our batteries in hot environments excuse me installing our inverters in hot environments mm -hmm. so the question is is there a shade enclosure that we recommend for our inverter and i'm going to say no because our inverter is allowed to be installed in direct sunlight i mean it's never a good idea you might experience some derating because uh, the inverter is getting hot but if you are in direct sunlight that is allowed so best practice is to put the inverter on the north face where it's not going to experience a lot of uh, direct sunlight or on the east face where when it does experience direct sunlight, then it is on the cooler parts of the day or the west face where it doesn't experience total direct sunlight. And then lastly, if you have to, because there's no other option, the south face. And if you have a shade enclosure or shade canopy, I've seen a lot of, you know, fabricated <laughs> options out there, but uh, nothing that we would recommend. Mm -hmm. But it's got no impact on the warranty or anything mm -hmm. like that. It's just best practice. That's correct. No impact on warranty, just best practice. Got it. Okay. All right. And that was the last question. All I right. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Again, my name is Cameron Stewart. And with me, we have Magnus Asbo. Uh, I really appreciate you guys took time out of your day. Please feel free to check out our online trainings. Check out our webinar schedules. We do this pretty regularly. And then I hope you have a safe and happy day. Take care, everybody. Stay sunny. Stay optimized. <laughs>